Could something like this be pulled off in Canada? I think that we're making a real difference from a museum perspective, historically, what we're going to bring to the Canadian public and anyone else that visits us here. You are about to have a unique experience. You are a very unique group of people because very few other Canadians can see this. You're going to feel the concussion of the guns going off. You're going to feel the shaking of the earth as these vehicles go around and on display for you. Applying the history lesson or providing the opportunity for people to learn is exactly what Aquino is. It's a venue that's not a textbook. We came out of the gate late. We were Canada's first. And now people are traveling from overseas to specifically come to this show. We're heading in the right direction and the people we have here that are so important, they're motivated, and they're here for the long haul. I'm really proud of that. This organization would not exist without the volunteer base. Yes, we have two full-time staff on at the museum, but it really comes down to the volunteers that are here. For this team, the sky's the limit. This should be the biggest. This should be the best one we've ever done. Months and months of planning have gone into this. All this planning, all this control, it now goes to you. So this museum is in the city of Oshawa, in the, the Durham region. We occupy the south field of the Oshawa Executive Airport. The physical space here is historical and important. And really the south field here is the only space, other than the runways themselves, that exists from when this was first created as a Commonwealth Air Training Program airfield. And this is actually where they trained the pilots to fly Spitfires and Hurricanes. and We had all those aircraft up here. Tens of thousands of Canadians and other members of the British Commonwealth came here to Oshawa. They got their pilot wings before they went on to combat training or bomber training. So this was a part of Second World War history right here in Oshawa. Historically, we couldn't be better located than right here. Queen of Day is an opportunity for us as a museum to show the public what we actually do. That's where we pull out all the stops. The three major reenactments we have is World War II, Vietnam, and then the Gulf War. Riding in the Land Rover with the machine gun was probably my favorite part. It's such a different experience to go from reading about them and watching movies and stuff to actually standing next to something like this or standing next to one of the tanks that are over there. They're, they're huge. We have uh, some vehicles in the crewmen that actually fought during the first Gulf War here. So we, they'll start off with the far end of the field and the, the bad guys, the Iraqis with the T-54 and BMP-1 will be at the opposite end of the field. And there'll be a skirmish that lasts about 10, 15 minutes and then uh, the outcome is yet to be decided. But it's not just the tank arena that, that has action in it. The rest of the, the south field also has reenactor camp set up, so they, they are able to tell the story of what camp life would have been like for, for these soldiers in World War II, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War. We have all the vehicles that we're not using in the show on display. We have a number of community partners that come up and, and also display. Just when you think you've got it, just when you think you have it all, you look and you see holes and you see windows where you know, we could put in an excellent thing there. There's always something moving and shaking. And that's what keeps the level of excitement going around here. We are well known for tanks and for military vehicles, but the museum is the regimental museum of the Ontario Regiment RCAC. So we have a static display that's in the main section of the museum, which uh, contains your typical artifacts, ammunition, guns, crests, badges, cap badges. This is a tank museum. We have Canadian, we have British, we have Russian, we have German, we have all kinds of different things here. We don't just have tanks, we have all the different vehicles that were used by the Canadian forces, you know, that supplement the tanks. So, you know, every mechanized army requires the quarter ton truck or Jeep, the logistics vehicles, the armored personnel carriers and the tank. So it's really a whole set, a team of vehicles and we have them all. How's it looking? Like a Humvee. Like a Humvee. 
we're going to take this tank out so that they can bring the Bren gun carrier back into the hole over there. And then I get to work on the Leopard. Looks good. Bad. Bad. That one's bad. Oh, Chief, we can't get it started. Well, hold it. We got a couple more sixes over there. That's one of the big problems here is be, A, the, some of the stuff's old and the equipment sits for a long time. The knowledge management of keeping an operational military fleet is one of our largest challenges. There's more knowledge uh, in maintaining a tank than what is in the old service manuals. You open up a 1954 service manual for a Centurion tank. Like any sort of manual, uh, it's telling you some basic step-by-step -step things, but because there's many things that are assumed, because if you're reading it in that time period, things are assumed that you already know that. That knowledge had to be passed down hand to hand, generation to generation, and has to go with the vehicle. Yeah, you do a lot of little things, you know, just getting a part painted and ready right. is, is half the battle because there's always rust in these old parts. And you have to be a machinist to figure this out. But if you actually look closely at this bolt, it's handmade. They don't use this type anymore of uh, grease nipple. It's uh, a World War II uh, standard, standard rather than the, the one that they use now, which is the clip on. This one here's got a funny little little case on it where you have to turn and uh, it's supposed to lock itself on. If there's nobody that knows how to operate a tank or fix a tank, that tank will no longer be an operational artifact. It's the type of volunteers that do come out that, that make this place special. Probably some of the be best people that I've worked with are, are the volunteers, are Jeremy, are Al. Everybody has the same objective in the end, and that's to, to honor our soldiers and, and, and the conflicts that they served in. I think we'll finish it this summer, probably, and maybe early, early fall at the latest. You start having tank Saturdays and the Kino, and you lose the time you would normally be working on a project. Thank you all for coming. I know that uh, the weather is not pleasant out there, and there's probably a few other stragglers that will come in. Aquino 5, can you believe it? I'm looking at the crowd, there's so many people here, this is so amazing. I know at least we're going to have 200 people at the gate. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad you're not paying. But yeah. The opening ceremonies were fielding five, about one or two, five leopards. We're all coming out, we want to stop, and then at the same time, all five leopards, all guns will be angled at the same thing, are going to pivot and face the crowd. Even with the five leopards, I don't think any of us have heard five run at the same time. I don't think we have. So it's going to be amazing. So 10 months in planning, 10 months. So we're here on a Wednesday, the show is in three days, but I can tell you that we started planning this show as soon as we caught our breath from the last show. Now it's just become a rhythm. The airport, the city, the fire department, uh, the police department, the traffic staff, the event staff. I shouldn't do this, but do Saturday, oh, sunny, 23. Yes! Woo! But stay tuned. Volunteers are the hub. They're the hub of this museum approximately about 140 volunteers and we can draw on some people from the Legion and the 420 Wing and Cadet Corps to actually help us. In some cases we have as many as 200 people helping on some major events. If not, I'll need the booster to start it probably. Sure. This is number one on uh, the hit list sure. and we'll hit her with something. Positive here. Don't know. Is it positive or negative? Yeah, because the Ford's exactly backwards from the to the normal road. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, that's fine, but we but I had to get no... that charger work. Or else it's that dead. It's not showing. Yeah, it could be that dead. These old ones. Ready? Yep. Just a little. Come on, you old pig. No fuel in there at all. No fuel tank. No fuel tank. What about this side? Well, we've got a line here, and maybe I'll just give her a pump. Line, line. No, no. All right, let's see down on the pedal here. Keep.
keeping volunteers motivated, you need to have someone at the helm, like Jeremy, that can keep them motivated with different projects. Many of our members, when it comes to technology and engineering and mechanics, are geniuses. Military jumper cables, called slave cables. I am often in awe. Just some mechanical fine tuning. Perfect. But it, it's truly the, the family that's here that, that makes it worthwhile being here. Primary objective number one is the complete setup of the field. For the public, the show starts tomorrow. For us, the show starts today. This is going to be the first A tent, the MASH. All right. Obo Army Surgical Hospital. <laughs> yeah, we've got the, the Army. People that make up the volunteer force on Aquino, it's mostly service clubs and veteran-based service clubs. Our partners are our four cadet corps, the Ontario Regiment Cadet Corps that are spread around Durham Region. It is the Royal Canadian Legion. And of course, right on site, the 420 Wing, Royal Canadian Air Force Association. So those organizations work with us to pull off our huge Remembrance Day parades and also things like a Kino Tank Weekend. It's not a museum show. It is all these partners coming together to put on a Queen out together. We are basically the uh, Can-Am RC Tank Club. We deal in one six scale combat of infrared combat with RC tanks. We come out here to show off what we got to the public. Hopefully get more members to come join us. I stalled it, son of a gun. Okay, thanks for coming. Friday is a huge day. As I said this morning, our Aquino starts today. A lot of coordination, a lot of work to be done. We still have a lot of vehicle movement to do. All the static vehicles need to go out into the field. And then once those vehicles are in position, Rich Bennett will be gathering teams to do first parades and vehicle checks on every single vehicle. I know that some of these vehicles have not been out in a year. I need a team to start taking the LSBW, fill it with fuel cans, and we're gonna start filling and fueling all of the vehicles in the field. Almost. Almost. We also have our friends here from World of Tanks, our brothers from across the sea. Are they here in the room? Sure. Yeah. There you go. We partnered with World of Tanks a couple of years ago, and it's been very beneficial for both parties. I mean, you, you have players that play online game and then they, they actually come here and they get to ride in some of the very vehicles that they play. A lot of work to do, awesome to see you all. I'm pumped, let's do it, thanks guys. I wanted something very dramatic. I wanted something very impressive. This year, it was the first time we had five Leopard 1 tanks running. Report again and let them know we're about to kick up a hell of a lot of dust. Somebody had the funny idea about synchronized tanks, like synchronized swimming. And so when we started talking about choreography, and like you don't think of a choreography in a, in a museum, right? And we all kind of jokingly said, well, let's just get them all at the same time, pivot, steer into, you know, the, to face the crowd. And as soon as everyone stops in position, go to neutral, do the neutral turn. Okay. Okay, and it's a neutral quarter turn. The two Belgian Leopards are 100%. They're totally complete, fully functional. The Canadian one that we got, it needs a lot of work, cosmetic. Now the Canadian Armed Forces have provided us with a lot of the damaged parts. The two trainer leopards that we have, one is more finished than the other. We would like eventually to get a power turret so that that turret is, is turning around and the gun elevates up and down. And we practiced and practiced. It took a lot of work getting the kinks out, but they pulled it off. I think everything's gonna work.
this weekend's looking good. Guides, tankers, and volunteers of the Ontario Regiment Museum, you are about to embark upon the Great Crusade, <laughs> towards which we have striven these many months. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in museology. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. Roll out. It's always rewarding after months and months and almost a year of planning to show up on that Saturday morning. And this south field that is normally quiet, it's a bustling area of activity that, that the public gets to enjoy. So as soon as you walk in the gate, you'll realize it's not your usual festival. There's vehicles lying around, there's historical encampments, reenactors, living history displays. Model tanks, there's remote controlled tanks for kids. There's a cross section of just about everything. It's one thing to go to a show to see pictures or artifacts, but when you actually bring the living artifacts out moving around, people can hear them, they can smell them, they can feel them. When these machines roll past the grandstands, the ground shakes. <laughs> We are here to commemorate the Battle of Aquino, which took place in the spring of 1944 on the western side of Italy. The Ontario Regiment was the armored unit that was supporting the infantry in that particular battle. And everybody who's associated with this museum either served with the Ontario Regiment or is directly related in some way to that regiment. Welcome to the Ontario Regiment Museum. And welcome to Aquino Tank Weekend. We're not like any other museum. We bring history to life. We have four veterans of the Second World War with us today, and they are going to be in vehicles that were related or specific to their service. It's interesting to work on these vehicles, but the hours that are put in are exceptional. They do it in memory of those soldiers and in memory of what they fought for and the fact that we are a very free society today because of that effort. gunners are going to be coming out. They're going to be driving a very cool vehicle that was actually found in a junkyard in Orillia a number of years ago. It's called a field artillery tractor. They called it a quad. So they've restored all this stuff and just done a wonderful job. It's hauling an ammunition trailer uh, that's called a limber and a 25 pounder quick firing gun and howitzer. Number nine battery in my command fire three rounds on your assigned target. Fire! Now imagine a whole bunch of those firing rapidly. It's one thing to have a cannon firing. If you don't see the explosion or the result of that cannon firing, you don't have that sense of realism. So we actually have a time where we fire a black powder or propane charge from a tank, and we, that's timed with a charge that's put in the ground, and it's usually covered with peat moss, something that just blows up into the air that's fairly safe, and it's very effective. So they're basically black powder based and they just act as lifters. So we put them at the bottom of our steel mortar and when it goes off, it creates a bit of a black smoky look 
It also throws whatever's in the mortar. So whatever debris we put in there is what comes out. What I'm about to do right now is just galp check it. That's to make sure that there's continuity between the actual wires to ensure that it will set off. You're definitely more mindful of your actions at this point in time and uh, where you're putting things um, and uh, if your wires are shunted properly. This well, is definitely the, the time when you pay attention to those things. She's ready for a receiver and to get filled. Just like that. We have uh, actors in the field and we certainly don't want to, to hit anybody with anything. If this rains down on people, it's, uh, it's not going to hurt anybody. So we do this and we add a little bit of bark mulch on top just to give it some extra color. And that's it. You do a battle reenactment of World War II, all you smell is black gunpowder and spent ammunition. That's the opportunity for these people to, to learn. All the reenactors here have authentic kit. By the way, if you're interested in firearms, all the firearms are authentic. They make unique sounds and we'll uh, be able to identify them by the sounds. Canadians uh, had a reputation of being very, very tough and throughout the war the Canadians were often given jobs that other armies thought could not be done. This event commemorates the battle 74 years ago when this regiment was fighting in the Italian campaign in the Second World War. The Allies were stalled south of Rome. They got into Italy uh, very little resistance and they thought things were going great and then they got stopped. Now with the infantry support pinned down by machine gun and mortar fire, the Ontario Regiment tanks advanced alone through the morning fog towards the trap. When the fog lifted, the tankers felt themselves alone. Our infantry was supposed to move forward, they couldn't. They were exposed to withering fire. They're taking cover. They should have been ahead, according to the plan. Canadians are taking a lot of casualties here. This is not working out the way they had hoped. Germans were ready. Although the breakthrough was not achieved in this engagement, the regiment fought with distinction. Considerable German reinforcements and material were pushed into the defense of the town and the airfield that would later be missed when the Allies did their main thrust through the Leary Valley. We got roughed up a little bit, but then we came back, and I think that's the story that's told. In defending this, the Germans had to put all their resources on it, and that did leave the openings that the Canadians had hoped for. It's all a big chess game of having your troops where the other guys weren't, and there was a elaborate ruses throughout the war. Now let's hear it for the vehicle crews and these reenactors. What an amazing, historically accurate show they put on for us this morning. 50 cal, fired. Solid as a souvenir. We work with the reenactors to say, okay, here's the scenario that we want to put on. Obviously, the people come out here for the gunfire. They want to hear the pops. You don't want to have a dull moment during those those reenactments. That's the actual Russian caliber, 12.7 uh, by 108 millimeter. These are nicknamed Hollywood blanks because they come in different strengths. These are called full flash, the most powerful, so you get more flash out of it than that because they contain a flash powder as well as gunpowder. These are real guns that, could, that actually fire live. So what we do is we convert them to fire blank. I would say that we're going to probably fire 20,000 rounds. No, I know how to run Possibly 20,000. Vietnam had been a French colony since the 19th century. When the Second War ended, the surrender of Japanese left a power vacuum in Southeast Asia. Vietnam was partitioned by the Geneva Conference with communists to the north and the Republic of Vietnam in the south. By 1964, the U.S. was completely drawn into the Vietnam War. Our scenario takes place in South Vietnam in 1967. An American long-range patrol, known as a LERP, had been tasked with curbing North Vietnam influence in the local area by eliminating the hated tax collector. But these tax collectors demanded food and money or whatever the farmers had and literally even their sons. If they did not comply with the tax collector, sometimes it was immediate death. Now we'll see the Americans, now they want to set up an ambush between two enemy uh, held villages and they know that the tax collector is patrolling that area and they're waiting for these guys to uh, hit a claymore mine that they've hidden. But they don't want to kill the tax collector. They want to put a kidnap on that guy. Oh! 
seems there's more Viet Cong around than the Americans guessed, and they're hot on them. The U.S. forces now just finishing their mop up. This was a successful operation. They got their tax collector and maybe got some intel from that guy. I enjoy the eureka moment that our visitors have. When students come in and discover this type of history, like that's what it's all about for me. It's going down the back stretch, it's like, <laughs> the whole way. You need better padding in that seat. You can stand up if you want to, or you can remain seated, but please take a position and stick to it, okay? It was very bumpy and extremely fun. Better than Wonderland. Yes. I rode in a armored personnel carrier my first time. I didn't realize how tight the space is inside. Amazing! Great! 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 Be careful, watch your heads, please. Keep your head low. And one unique thing that we do have here is we have what we call Battle Royale where we actually have two vehicles, and the two of them we pit against one another. Here comes our first contenders. They are in an M60A3 Patton main battle tank. And here comes the Challenger. It's one of our Leopards. This is our Belgian Leopard 1A5. Both of them are firing oxygen propane cannons. We always have the crowd judge who was the winner. Roll out. It looks like the M60 is in firing position. One shot by the Leopard. The M60 being a much heavier tank with more armor, especially in the front of the vehicle but the Leopard has a speed advantage with lighter armor. The M60's gun does have some kick. Oh, and that is a hit by the Leopard. It's very loud, and you want to see tanks moving the way they move in battle. That's the closest thing as we're going to get to it. Now, by applause, who believes the M60 Patton won the tank battle? Who believes the Leopard 1 won the tank battle? All right, let's hear it for our war gamers. Well, this weekend, I'm at the, the Aquino Tank Fest. Uh, which I come to every year by invitation from Alan Duffy to crew these vehicles that we all served in during the Gulf War. This is a Stryker guided weapons vehicle. It flew a anti-tank guided weapon missile system that was capable at that time of taking out any known battle tank in the Western world. It's a lot of fun. The machine's got a ton of horsepower, a lot of torque, very easy to drive. You can drive it all day long and not get tired. You do get warm, but you don't get tired. It's amazing to have these very vets and the very vehicles were stored exactly as they were. Today's military has changed a lot from the World War II where most of the soldiers were males now. Men and women serve in combat and there's a, a young woman actually operating the M60 today. Fire some cannons, fire some rifles on the tanks as well. Um, probably the most fun part about the day. <laughs> I love it. Be involved in this is just probably one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Look, we've already showed a lot of our friends and they're already jealous. They're like, oh my gosh, I wish we came. It's an honor to do this every year, to get a chance to be on this vehicle. And it just brings back lots of memories, you know, good and bad, but mostly good. couldn't even see where the enemy was. The Americans knew where they were, they could basically program uh, munitions just to land on them. The Iraqis have surrendered and that's basically how the whole war went down. Okay, let's hear it for the volunteers and veterans of the Gulf War. Yeah, yeah.
This past weekend we had the grand opening of the Military Vehicle Conservation Center. We had the opportunity to invite politicians, our volunteer base, our community partners to really come down and celebrate. You know, I look around and I'm amazed. This building isn't about Next Tank Saturday or the current generation of museum members. It's about generations down the road. For 150 years, the Ontario Regiment has helped shape the character and the reputation of our community. What better way to recall and celebrate that contribution by preserving and displaying this military vehicle collection for future generations?